Professor Ravindran, I was uh, uh, trying to do some research on your uh, work that has been uh, done during your career. I have seen uh, four different stages. Mm -hmm. Probably we will restrict uh, the uh, interview to these four stages. And it is uh, probably for everybody uh, uh, who has uh, done as much work as you we we'll have much more stages, but uh, uh, that we'll see later on whether it can be asked. First one is, of course, your childhood uh, uh, schooling. And uh, you studied in PhD college. Yes. Uh, so the first stage is up to completion of undergraduate uh, yes. course in mechanical engineering in PhD. Second stage, uh, though there is some employment in between, but you came to IIT as a technical teacher training yes. and then uh, you joined the faculty, mm -hmm. uh, worked in turbo machines laboratory mm -hmm. and uh, I know fully well that uh, you are, uh, your heart is more in the turbo machine laboratory wherein you, know, you have developed a lot of uh, mm -hmm. experimental setup. Mm -hmm. So that is the second stage. Of course in between you went to Germany, there also you had uh, uh, you know, made use of whatever is possible in Germany to, uh, yes. you know, get your uh, PhD uh, done back here in India. Mm -hmm. So that will be the second stage. Mm -hmm. The third stage is uh, in ocean engineering, because uh, the director has identified you as, you know, uh, yes. a faculty for ocean engineering to to cut a lot of work. Uh, um, In establishing the department, experimental facilities, yes. I know a little more in detail because I was also working yes, with you yes. at that time, so therefore uh, that is the next stage. Then there is a fourth stage probably uh, that is the biggest contribution that you have done for the country in developing ocean technology. That is the as the di founder director of I the NIOT, which is uh, an offshoot from IIT to start with, but it has grown much beyond IIT uh, before you stepped down at the age of Zobranisian. Later, if you add one more stage, it will be the uh, stage wherein you are giving back to the society, and that is something uh, which many people don't do. Those who are doing, they may like to pay some money and then forget about it. But in your case, it is doing things to make life in a very rural setting much more comfortable. And your uh, so association with the, uh, the tribal health initiative and these are something which uh, uh, many of our friends should learn so that they give back to the society what they have derived from it. And that is probably uh, the fourth stage of your uh, work career. Out of this uh, all different segments, where do you, which one do you think is the most important? Why? See, there are uh, the, depending upon the importance it uh, means to me personally and to the to the nations around around the country, I will differentiate that the contribution to the country as a new development of an institute of ocean technology, the first time in our country, is a contribution to the nation because that has uh, really started on a good way and if IIT and uh, we have not worked together that institute would not have come at all. Yes. So that was a very great effort and contribution to the nation in the field of ocean technology. The other one, uh, the social, society related uh, activity is giving me a great pleasure yeah. because uh, there you see that uh, there are people who need of help and we are able to give them some help and they are extremely happy and you can see that it is useful to them immediately. So that way I found that uh, that these two are two different aspects you know. 
This yes. is a pride coming from our contribution to the nation on high technology, new technology. Whereas that is coming from contribution to humans. Mm. From what is your capability, you are helping people and and you are happy that it is useful to them. So these are two different uh, things at two different levels. But both of things I, I give really uh, good equal, equal weightage to okay. both of them. Yeah, I always uh, uh, look upon you as an institution builder. Because not only in IIT, where in an in ocean engineering department, uh, from practically nothing, it has come to a stage wherein it is one of the best laboratories in the country and perhaps in Southeast Asia. And uh, NIOT, of course, there is no question. I, mean, I, I, I knew that that is, your heart was in that. Almost uh, nearly 10 years as founder director, I think, uh, from practically nothing. A piece of paper wherein MO is written between IAD and DOD to what you see in Panikarne right now is because of your uh, planning. Uh, that way, I think you can be very, very proud of as an institution builder. Yeah. And of course, uh, to the society, what you're yes. giving back is something uh, uh, that but is probably. That came by accident. I didn't plan for it. Okay. I didn't want it. Actually, it came out of the interest of the IIT okay. to help the government to build this institution. So when uh, the government made a request to the then director IIT Madras and uh, through the dean, Professor Raju. So they said yes. If at all somebody could develop this institute, only uh, IIT Madras could initiate this. We will provide the initial uh, infrastructure, administrative support. Okay. And they said, we need somebody to lead it. We will also give you a person to lead it without even telling me they <laughs> proposed my name. Now that is the type of confidence the IIT system had in so, Professor uh, I owe this that only to the institute, and IIT. Uh, you have also proven the confidence <laughs> that has been uh, put on you. Okay, let us go back to the stage one. Yes. Uh, the childhood, your schooling, yes. and up to BA mechanical engineering yes. and PhD. Yes. Briefly, you can touch upon. It is more a biographical. Mm, yes. I came from a very small family and uh, my father was an accountant. I studied in a school which was totally free in Virudhanagar and uh, I studied uh, pre university also in a college which is in uh, this thing and I had good academic record. But uh, my father was an accountant and he was sick that time and then uh, he said, okay, if you want to study engineering, you put only one application. If you get one, admission at that time, you know, you go otherwise, we'll do some work here. So I applied and I got admission to PhD Tech. That's how I started my career. Then, there also, I in involved myself in uh, learning subject much better and did a lot of hands-on work, even for the final year B.Tech. B, I mean, we did some of our friends together, we designed a working windmill mm. at that time developing 300 watts and put in the top of our uh, administrative building, PhD tech, which was working actually. So that was first happiness we said we could design a machine. This is sometime in 1966. 66. So, yeah, so that was long time. So, so we fabricated. Windmills were not even uh, no, known yeah, at that time. Yeah. Well, what was the motivation to... Actually, to it was a, a funded project by CSIR. One of the faculty has taken it and he left. <laughs> so the institute was under constraint to complete the project and the, the professor requested me whether we could take it up and complete and that was one of the things. And it went as a report to CSIR for completion and we were very proud of that. And uh, for example, the blade. Yes. You know, Probably there were no design curves at that time. Yes, yes, on. yes. How uh, did you? How did you? Actually, uh, that's why you no. Know, I was basically somehow uh, I had an inbuilt interest on turbo machinery. So when this uh, request came, uh, there was a Russian book, and I requested one of the professors, Kandasamy. I said, please translate that because there were no other books to uh, design the windmill. So Russians had a book. I forgot the name of it, but he translated and then. And there was one more book put down. I remember that. 
So we designed and we incorporated a new uh, device because the, there was a previous model made by that faculty who left. The blades flew off when there were strong winds. So I was thinking, you know, somehow we should have a speed limiting device, mm -hmm. something which is automatic. Okay. We thought about that and what we did was, you know, we arranged the blades with a yeah, bearing, a sleeve bearing at the root, the hub. So due to the centrifugal force, the blades will be moving at a particular offset uh, radially outwards. At that time, the blades will have a pin in their axis and the pin will be guided by a helical screw guide. So as it moves out, it will turn the pitch. So the automatically the angle of attack comes down. So the torque at high speeds automatically became less. So it was a self-regulating speed control. Technology is even today it is the same probably. Similar, similar, yes. It is almost uh, maybe. Yeah, now almost they have complicated uh, yes. uh, when adjusting mechanism is very expensive. But on a small blade machine like 300 watts, we could afford it. Nobody could provide such a complicated mechanism of a vein adjusting mechanism, which is similar to our Kaplan turbine blades, you know. So we decided itself, you know, it was spring loaded. So it only works when the, the single forces are too high, then they get back to the normal mode when the speeds are normal. So that's what. It's really automatic. Automatic. <laughs> self regulating Okay. Uh, what about the generator? Generator, we just bought a locally a, a car uh, dynamometer, DC dynamometer, 300 sure. watts. So it was a DC. And it was a, simply a lap load. It was a, just a demonstration project that we could design for a given wind speed. So that so was a. Uh, like in similar projects, you, know, you must have connected it to uh, lamp load, uh, yes. lamp load. And, lamp load. Uh, and what so was your uh, feeling when uh, the, the, the. It was very nice and. and uh, all the more happiness we got was our batch, our group, of three of us were given the best uh, project award by the faculty. We were taken to a big week in color. It was very nice. It was to go and Professor Subramanian was later vice chancellor of uh, Bharati University. Mm -hmm. He was my guide. So it was a nice feeling that something we made works. Okay. Works yeah, for I a long time. It is not that it runs for two days and stops. So that was a good feeling. So. That's why when I came to IIT, when the head of the department asked me which lab you want to go, I said I want to go to Tobo Mission. <laughs> okay, we'll come to that. <laughs> yeah. But do you still continue your contacts with PSC uh, in some? Uh, very uh, little, but uh, we have contact. But uh, we have the alumni association, but I am not continuing the technical contacts. So I was continuing uh, till about five years ago because I was also a Naval Research Board Chairman, we were able to fund and uh, I was part of the root tag of IIT Madras. So in these connections, uh, we have gone for discussions with them to do projects for us. Okay. And uh, but they were a bit slow on that. So they were not coming forward, uh, but they were otherwise busy. So we lost interest in them basically, because uh, the PhD people uh, I think yeah. probably they have their own priorities. Priorities, yes. that's because they were mainly concentrating on undergraduate B-Tech. Yeah. And the mechanical department was very good, but uh, they were not very keen on uh, doing uh, sponsored such funding. Probably they wanted to come out with large enough number of graduates. Yes, and they uh, are expanding that they have yeah. into one more institution. They are on a uh, this thing expansion mode at the B-Tech level, maybe a little bit of M-Tech. But we have these alumni meetings for the last 51 years. I see. It is still are, going on every year. And it is held only in the college itself. No, not college. No, we meet outside. Except the 50th anniversary mm -hmm. and the Silver Jubilee 25th anniversary. All the other meetings are, it's for a family get together of our okay. classmates. It is nothing technical. Okay. We meet, uh, spend two, three days together. And we are planning for a foreign trip this year, next year, early next year to Thailand. Oh, I see, okay. 70 people are going to be 60 to 62 people, yes. Okay. Uh, do you remember some of your uh, very close friends who have reached, uh, you know, uh, some stage uh, where, you know, uh, who have done very well in, uh, in, in, in... My 
got be, to take back uh, your, your own bags. Yes, yeah. there are many of them. Some of the people who were in uh, BHL Trichy, they came out and started uh, firms, consultancy firms, engineering firms like uh, Fishner and uh, uh, Yen Chandrasekharan. I think he became a big industrialist. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Coimbatore itself, there is one uh, Balasundaram, who was electrical in branch, and uh, he is with that KG group, and then uh, he is in charge of this Trigger uh, Jeans uh, company, and he himself runs a stock broking, okay, and became oh. a financial management man. Okay. And uh, my own uh, namesake, my roommate, there the PJ, he put people as per the alphabetical order. <laughs> so I have another classmate, my Ravindra, and from me. Uh, that to metabolism, he is uh, interested in making uh, this you know, paper, newspaper. Actually, he got in Madras, Andhra. So he is a successful uh, person. We have some people employed in industries also. On Ranganathan, who was given a person's award, he was a BIL uh, chief executive in the last night. Bangalore. Okay, so. Like that. That was perhaps, uh, you know, after the graduation. Um, Probably you were always inclined to go for higher studies. Yes, that was my interest actually. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, somehow, you know, when they started uh, applying for, uh, when they started about engineering education, I came to know about, I heard that IIT Mentors has started, so I wanted to apply. Sometime in uh, February, March, I was thinking. Then they said, you, you, you fellow, you're too late. <laughs> I never knew that we have to uh, write an exam. So at that time itself, I was thinking, so IIT is something different, we should go. But um, immediately after my graduation, there was some compulsion uh, from my family that I should go for work. Mm -hmm. So when I saw this advertisement for uh, te technical teacher training program, which was a uh, central government program, Ministry of Education, to select candidates for uh, yeah, teaching career. At that time, it's, you know, when there were so few engineering colleges, they thought of developing good faculty for uh, engineering colleges. So they started this program for providing a uh, master's degree as well as giving them training in teaching in standard institutions like IIT Madras and IIT. So I applied for it. I was very lucky to get selected. So we got almost uh, double the scholarship compared to uh, the MTech. Okay. And uh, we were also given an opportunity to work in institutions like IIT work with the German professors, I think that was the greatest opportunity in my life, I thought. My interest, it's not just doing MTech, but this opportunity to work with German professor, even short period, I think that was a very great uh, experience I could learn. What was the year when you came to IIT? 1960, immediately after graduation, yeah. I worked for one month in a local Karakuri Engineering College. Okay. I left that and then joined here. And that professor, at that time he was a Professor Vijayaram was later in the oh, okay. principal. He said, you should go to IIT. He said, you don't have to work in Karakuri, please go to IIT. <laughs> so he relieved me and then he said, go. So at that time, IIT was a great uh, ambition in life, you know, we should get into yeah, IIT yeah, and then yeah. get in tech. So that was, the, so immediately came and joined here. 66 okay. August, very And. Uh, Probably, uh, you know, you thought, I, I don't know whether you were always having an inclination to work in the faculty of IIT because after these three years of uh, technical teacher training, uh, you will be allotted some college by yes. the government. And yes, then, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, still you had interest in continuing in IIT in the faculty. So it was like this. You see, the one of the conditions of the uh, selection for the teacher training program was that we should serve at least three years in any engineering college anywhere decided anywhere. by the ministry anywhere in India. So we had accepted that. So I had uh, accepted the condition. But I had a very lucky break, uh, I should tell you now, it's because I don't know how many people had this opportunity. During these three years, you know, I was given a very, very tough task of erecting certain test trick, very complicated test tricks fabrication, erection, testing by the German professor. This is in addition to, to your the course work? Yes, course work. He said, 
your coursework is your own personal benefit. Because that was, he was a very tough one. That's why not many people who wanted to work under this professor yes, Shear. I have great respect for him. He's a German attitude. German. And he said, you know, at that time there were many German professors in IIT Madras. In mechanics, so there were, what, what they did was, they brought equipments and erected them. So they could develop uh, the laboratories fast. Well, th this professor Shear said, no, I want you guys to design, fabricate, and erect, and operate. So this was a very slow, painful process. Mm -hmm. And it was very tough. Not many people wanted to do this faculty. So the initial faculty ran away from me. So let's say when I told you other day that when uh, Head of the department asked me where do you want to go. I said, I want to go to Tobago. So he said, Don't come and cry to me that I have ruined your career. I said, What is wrong with Tobago? Later on, I knew that because of his very tough attitude that doing work is the only thing. He will never give me. You have to do all the drawings yourself. You have to go to the central workshop, get them fabricated, erect, everything you have to do, like a very factory level, which many of the initial faculty didn't want. But most of it were done by you alone? No, there was Probably a... Probably technical help. That, that was advantage, you know. The German design was that each laboratory, we had at the time 10 laboratories in mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. had its own full coat of technical staff and equipment, like lathe, milling machine, shaping machine, yeah. small uh, milling machine for uh, tool making, this really huge drilling, radial drilling machine. So we were well equipped to do the fabrication within ours. Whatever could not be done could be done in central workshop. Yeah. So most of the equipment, like all the welding equipment, gas welding, arc welding, everything was provided to us. And this professor will come and supervise that we are doing it correctly. So that is the best training period I ever had. Then he will say, I am going to teach turbo machines, all you guys come and attend. So me along with uh, Professor Venetrailu, who was at that time my batchmate. We used to carry all the equipment of turbo machinery models, you know, to the class and he will explain. I'm one of the best teachers in practical things. So compared to what I learned in undergraduate, I learned more attending his lecture in IIT by Professor Shear on turbo machines on theory, design, fabrication and performance test. Complete, it was a total course. Which, which university in Germany he was associated? He was associated with Braunschweig, Technical University of Braunschweig. And uh, he, was, he was he was a war veteran, then he has completed his PhD. And uh, he, when he came here, none of the facilities were available. So he was teaching drawing. He was also designated as professor of drawing. So he used to be a very meticulous uh, instructor for drawing. So you will say, everything should have a drawing. Even if you make a chalk piece holder, there should be a drawing. So he designed a system of uh, designation of drawings, numbering of drawings, storing them, and assembling them. He got his equipment to keep drawings probably. All those things are still available after almost 50 years. You can even get that. So that is the way he taught us meticulously. I was in just some keys, you know. Every key in the laboratory, every table, every door, every cupboard key will have a duplicate, will be in a central keyboard. I was a key man in that, key in charge. Like that, you know, for everything there was perfect discipline. We taught us. It's no wonder that you transferred <laughs> any of these things. So that is the best part of my learning in my life was that three years I went to the position. Now, turbo machines laboratory, uh, you have completed your masters in three years. Yes. Uh, yes. Before I come to a very pertinent uh, question, which uh, is about the situation of laboratories in uh, in, in Madras and Madras. Mm -hmm. uh, was there any offer from the government of India for you to go to some college after completion of it? That is uh, the I was just I was about to say that, you know, after I submitted my PhD thesis uh, with the fabrication work of the test trick for the axle floor running machine, then I took an extra project title of uh, studying the inlet flow region of axle pumps. So that was also experimental, theoretical. So when I put all this work together, 
in the three years of work together, it became so thick. And I presented the entire result to the committee. Professor Trinaran was the examiner. Head of the department of IAC okay. in mechanics department was the examiner. That, that was the level at which MTech exams were held at that time. Okay. You know, I, I don't think we get those people even for PhDs now. He came and asked, what Ravindra, after all you are going to be, after all you are going to be a teacher, why have you done so much of work? Design, fabrication, experiments, making probes, calibrating them. Then I told him, at that time I had the offer from Calicut University to go, I had the offer. Okay. I told him, sir, uh, any teacher should have the capability and confidence to design machines, fabricate them, erect them and make them work successfully for the design specification has made. I have done this. I have this conference. So wherever I go, I will be a good teacher because I can teach the students how to design, fabricate, commission with all practical knowledge. So wherever I go, I will be a good teacher. Then the head of the department was present. He was head of the YOC board. board. He said, uh, he need not go anywhere. Myself and uh, Vengashwai, my classmate. They can join us as faculty tomorrow. Just like the, on the Viva examination day, he said they can join us on a dog basis, and which was at that time Dr. Ramachandran was the director. Okay. He got us regularized as a faculty a few months later. That's how I entered as a faculty. My transition from teacher trainee to faculty happened in uh, 69 August, September, on the Viva day. I don't think many uh, people have had this uh, lucky. Uh, uh, chance no, to I become don't a be any comparison at all anyway. Because uh, to get into this, you know, you have to go through so much a process. Yeah. Where it's just like that, we got into IIT. Okay. Now, we had a person uh, who has been down to earth. Yeah. So, you know, working in the laboratory, uh, designing your own stuff, getting it fabricated, mm -hmm. and totally hands on. What do you think uh, about the percent engineers? I am not asking about IITs uh, at all. If you go to a typical engineering college where uh, uh, graduates are uh, produced, do you think they get? Uh, they are lucky to get into you know such type of an education? So in not except in few institutions, bulk of the percent engineering students do not get this opportunity. One of the reasons being in the last uh, decade has been that uh, the IT companies came and selected them and gave them some jobs totally unconnected with what they said. So slowly the students lost interest in hands-on work. The faculty also thought it was necess unnecessary to train them. Because anyway they get a job. Correct. And that has nothing to do with what they learned. Yes. So sometimes the offers came in the third year itself, so fourth year they never learned anything. So now that's why some of the uh, the government rule has come that uh, you should come for campus only in the fourth year. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very negative aspect because uh, what for we train engineers? They should have a yeah, problem solving capability for their own industries around them. You can also do R&D, yes. excellence, then you publish, take patents. That's one way of going up in your career, but otherwise you are supposed to transfer your capability to problem solving practical industries. Develop something what society needs. Yeah. Can somebody design a machine? So that capability is totally missing. So many people ask me to come and teach. I say, yeah, we don't want. But we're not to call now and go, I'm stressing this. I'm making them do hands on work. You know, not a few institutions where I'm just mentoring. I am stressing, but 85% of the students who are getting undergraduate degrees, they don't get this hands-on experience at all. Unfortunately, teachers are also not very very much inclined to take that type of Because they have never seen an industry. Yes. I can give you one disastrous uh, situation. I will not tell the institution. I was talking to a faculty who was a student of the same college. It's in one student I said, sir, electrical student, huh? I, sir, I have not seen an induction motor. This faculty said, I myself have not seen one. If this is the status of the faculty, what good is the uh, degree of the undergraduate student studying under him? So, I think it's very, very important that 
we should come back to this hands on experience by making it compulsory for the institutions to work with industries and for students to work with industrial problems. Yeah. I think that is, that is the sad part of the engineering education today. Don't you think that to some extent uh, that has also come into the IIT system, you know, where probably uh, they are a little better off than the normal uh, yeah. colleges? My own experience, uh, see, because uh, that was very uh, clearly expressed by the, some of the visiting professors who came for the 50th anniversary of the Indo-German collaboration. Some of Professor Shear himself was there, his assistants were all there. But some of the remarks were very, very uh, painful to hear, saying that the facility which they created in the late 60s, early 70s were all coming down in its uh, quality and effectiveness and IIT Madras never took an initiative to upgrade them. Okay. Especially Professor Lutz was almost crying, you see, his uh, boilers and steam turbines have disappeared. Yes. And uh, our own lab, you know, some things are working, the original German equipment he brought uh, some turbines imported. They were all corroded and this thing, they were not replaced. So, and the, the, the workshop manpower, not there. So the students were very reluctant to take up masters and PhD programs in such labs. Yeah. I think that has killed the initiative on hands-on experience for the people because we did so much of our, we used to work in the lathe and the milling machine ourselves to manufacture, weld ourselves. We had training in welding because number of pipelines were 14 pipelines we used to weld for our test tricks. So that type of experience our students are not being given by default, no? because we don't have the manpower. So people are saying away, okay, if I go for experiment work, I will get all the things fabricated outside. It is time consuming, it is expensive, easy way to sit before the company to do some modeling. Easily you can publish papers, you can get your MTech or PAC. That seems to be the trend nowadays, even in IITs. I am not very happy with that. Because that may be good for uh, getting our admissions abroad and going, there, but that is not expected for an engineer to contribute to the local industries. I am very, very, very particular about that, that IIT is uh, not contributing enough to the hands-on experience of students. Even the number of those days we used to have workshop week completely. Yeah. Whole week there is to work in uh, all the lab. Workshops are the central workshop, carpentry, smithy, machine tools lab. Building lab. <coughs> Nowadays, that workshop also is reduced. Yeah. And one of the contributing factors is that the five year program came became four year program. Yes. They expect a lot of work to go into the plus two. Yes. But that didn't happen. We lost something in this process. Engineering education lost some very precious time in educating them in this because we lost one year of the insection. Okay, but uh, coming to the student's point of view, because once I know one of my uh, friend's son who joined computer science here, he asked me, why should I do a workshop? Because in my lifetime, I will never even look at any of these machines because it is not necessary. And slowly from computer science, the same question is being asked even by mechanical engineers, you know. Why should I do workshop? Why should I dirty my hand when I can get, uh, you know, complete my courses and also complete my project without uh, yes. just dirtying my hands? That is looking very, a very narrow approach to life. Yes. You see, you can be a computer science engineer, be a computer science man all the time. Look at uh, servicing of computers or develop computer language, hardware, software, all that. That means your part of life is restricted to a very small group of experts. But in a field like mechanical engineering, you can do computer simulations, stress analysis, software practice, all that you can be do with only with computer knowledge. But finally, who will make a hardware? Yeah. Somebody has to produce things, things around us. Who is manufacturing them? Who designs the machines to manufacture them? Who ma machines the, uh, who manufactures the tools, dies, tool bits, 
to machine this, material development, machining process, finishing process. Who does that? He has to be a practical engineer. Who developed that? That interface is totally, that's why we are not making any new machines in our country. Yeah. We buy and use them. Yes. Are we making new machines? Are we designing new machines? Are we developing new technologies? Are we taking new patents which are possible to be made for our own industry? That is our weakness. Unless we improve upon this physical hands-on experience for our own engineers, we are going to be always a second generation of machine users. So to make our Make in India successful, you think that the entire uh, engineering education has to be revamped? Definitely. See, nowadays Make in India is import technology yeah, used factory. You are using our cheap labor. That is not Make in India. Make in India is really that you design. Make our R&D laboratories, technology development laboratories to, to make mistakes and design. Give them time and a chance to make mistakes and learn. Hands-on experience. Develop their own machines. Support them. Where do we support them to make? Yeah, unfortunately that is the situation. Unfortunately in defense also, the same thing has happened. I have seen in defense laboratories, you have seen in defense laboratories. Lot of work is done, but they will never buy the final product. Mm. There are some vested interest, difficulties. Maybe some of them are not reliable, materials are not the best, but we should give them a chance to improve. In many cases, like space, we have proven that we can do wonders. Yeah. Why the same chance is not being given to other industries? The support that ISRO enjoys today, or atomic energy enjoys today, Science and technology department is not enjoined. Human resource department is not enjoined. That is why our education system is suffering. Science and technology is suffering. Technology development is suffering. Because our education systems also have fallen into that trap that we make people more computer based, not hardware based or science based. See, unfortunately, the, the ultimately what happens is even the faculty who are joining. Many of them do not have any, any hands-on experience at all. Yes. Similar thing will happen. I told you, one faculty said in one of I have not seen next machine. Same thing will happen to some of these people. High-tech computer science engineers are high-tech uh, chemical engineer. He may, he may not see a lathe or this thing. He may not be able to do any work. So that should not, we should not uh, allow this degradation of the practical knowledge to happen in our yeah, uh, let us hope that uh, I mean, your, uh, these remarks will lead <laughs> some change where and another there will be some. Yeah, that is my sadness here. That yeah, because yeah. I started my career with so much of uh, this thing and all. I see before my eyes a yeah, change of trend. Mm. That many people thinking that we don't have to do this. The younger generation thinks that hands on experience is not required. That is my saddest uh, feeling as an engineer, as a mechanical engineer. Our ocean engineer. Shall we stop for some time? Or? We, we can. Ten ten we have another 10 minutes uh, which oh, we can use. Yes. Okay. Before we need to stop. <coughs> no, I can understand your uh, you know hard feeling <laughs> because uh, <laughs> you have done uh, so much uh, to the laboratory. It has been brought to a certain stage. Have you visited uh, the laboratory again? Not before or after that 50th year, uh, uh, Golden Jubilee year? I have been visiting, especially Washington Center I have visited, but uh, Turbo Mission yeah. Laboratory, I think once or twice I have gone. But uh, things are not very, very well, because the number of faculty, yeah. you see, for example, uh, I am attached to the Turbo Mission Laboratory because uh, no institution or country is teaching the Turbo Machines similar to what the German system as uh, introduced here. Uh, pumps, turbines, steam turbines or gas turbines, they all are uh, taught in a unified theory and special fluid pro related properties are sub separately. So we have two groups of turbo machines and uh, the knowledge those days we used to have a turbo machine lecture for two years in the five year stream. So a person could without any knowledge of uh, pumps or turbines earlier could design a turbine fabricate. So all our MTech students those days, 
do a fabrication of a pump or a turbine and do the testing. That was our standard at that time. Okay. That means when they go to the industry, what does the industry need? The R&D department. We develop engineers for R&D department. So we want him to be capable of designing a new system or a modify the existing impeller to a new application, modify the materials to a new fluid we handled, a slurry pump or a turbine. Oh, so even the faculty professor, uh, Prithivaraj, uh, everybody was able to design hands-on things. I think that what is, is helping the development of new machines, new ideas can be transferred into new hardware if you have the practical knowledge of doing that. But if you are sitting before a computer only, that becomes very difficult. Because I, I, I forgot to tell you also that turbine, the research on which I did uh, on a reversible pump turbine, actual turbine developing about 50 kilowatts of power. The entire rotors were machined by me right from scratch from a bronze metal. I cost the material worked in a decal milling machine because they didn't have labor. I worked in Germany. I brought in my personal suitcase all these machine components assembled here and tested it. I tested it for nine months, day and night. My thesis will be experimental work is so much. All the associated measuring systems, calibrating them. Nowadays these people do not know what is an error analysis. What is a fabrication of a probe? Three dimensions of probe or how do you measure the flow field in a impeller? Nobody knows. They can do maybe a computer simulation, but how do you validate your yeah. computer in a fluid mechanics? That is something missing. In that is something is very much missing in our present training program. Okay. Immediately after uh, you know the initial uh, stages, I think you had an opportunity to go, go to Germany on a, under a DID scholarship. Yes. Yeah, that was immediately after joining in uh, 1971 after I finished my MTech. There was an opportunity. I applied for a scholarship over to the government of India. At that time, there was a All India quota, and IIT Madras enjoyed a Special private quota, course. but I was too junior, so I could not get that. So I applied. I was lucky to get that. Another lucky break I had. So I went along with senior people of my faculty, who were my teachers. I went with them to try <laughs> Germany for training, and worked in a laboratory there. Also, I had an opportunity where the professor said, uh, "You should." Uh, Teach, uh, learn, speak to me only in German language, learn the language very nicely and do the work here. I started all these lectures in German language. Mm -hmm. So that also, and they gave me total freedom to develop the computer, even though I didn't know a computer program at that time. Those days, the IBM 370 was the only computer in IIT Madras and the telephone equivalent was there. We used to have uh, 2000 uh, cards for the code. So all that was learned by me newly in Germany. They supported me and when I wanted to fabricate the turbine, they said, okay, I approached a private company called Deckel Military. We had a lot of copy building machines from them. When I told them I'm from IIT Madras, I would like to develop. He said, we don't have people, but you are welcome to come and use our machines. I worked there, machine myself, four months. I made about uh, 26, 27 different type of blades. Assemble them. It is not a copying. Uh, copying, but, but, but so different it's types, it's you know. Really, okay. 13 blades of guide blades, axle flow guide blades, and then the three different rotors with three different profiles. Each uh, rotor having uh, six blades. I have to make them. So, cast them, then copy mill them, finish them, check their profile, if necessary, modify it. I brought them here, okay, assemble them, ran them at 2000 RPM, it is not that, you know. Yeah. It is a real pump real turbine, we worked as a pump and turbine power pole drive, it was a machine for tidal power plants. So with associated planning of the performance, how is the flow distribution, three-dimensional flow, three-dimensional components of velocity, static pressure, dynamic pressures, flow rates, completely measured, then mechanical power, speed, torque, accurately. <coughs> so that was the work that was how long you were there in Germany? Nearly two and a half years I was there. That was apart apart from language course. Uh, no, yeah. including language including course. Language, yeah. It was completely in uh, Technische University. Munich, Munich, it was in the Munich and uh, it was totally 
it was a very nice experience because there I could really see the total advancement of uh, technology, experimental technology to measure things in a rotating machine. That is, measure the flow velocities, static pressures on the rotor blade, transfer them through the slip rings physically and then take the signal out on 30 per variety of this, those days. And even the uh, three-dimensional velocity probes where you have the radial common velocity in water had minute trans, you know, the cool like ones. Yeah. Six of them in a five millimeter uh, <laughs> base. Such was the quality of manufacture. So that was, that was real learning. And since I could speak German language fluently, I could yeah, talk to them and learn a lot of this. Very nice. I had my family with me, wife, son. So we I'm enjoyed our <laughs> said uh, you worked in Deckel, no? Deckel milling machine, yes. How is that, you know, the uh, uh, totally, you know, strange uh, person from a very strange country, they just leave the equipment to you to, you know, yes. to fabricate whatever you Th that, that is what, you know, the universities have such a big uh, respect from the industries. So when somebody so from an uh, institute wants to come and work for their research, they offer the facilities. They like to involve with uh, work okay. with the industries, you know. I had a person from uh, Sandra Finnish who make automatic uh, uh, gears uh, car. He is a CEO of the company. So when the university requested him to come and take lectures of hydraulic systems, because the hydraulic torque converters, you know, he left half the job and then he said, one hour per week only he will take class. But he said, I should be called only professor. So, they had such a major yeah. respect for university systems and he used to take all the students to his company, take them around, give them good gifts of tool kits. I still have those tool kits which is 54 years old. Okay. So, that was the respect of the university by the industrial people. So, you were in uh, München two and a half years. Mm -hmm. You know Munich is... Uh, most famous for its beer yes. and the October Fest. Yes. I still wonder how you have not even tasted beer. Yeah. At that time, yeah. The problem was that, you know, that German beer is the purest beer in the world. Yeah. By law, they have uh, prevented any uh, flavors being added. added. So, so the German beer is very bitter. I never have to taste for German beer. So, the October first, the professor used to take on an official picnic, Vetri Trudla, they call it, okay. to October first, where they drink from 11 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock in the night. It is fun. People drink, eat, drink, and then play music. Yeah. It's called the October first music, yeah. all trumpets only. So, in a tent, there are about 30,000 people sitting and eating and drinking and dancing. Great yeah. fun. <laughs> but beer itself we never found a taste. But that beer is really bitter. German beer is okay. really bitter. And they always consume the beer in uh, one liter. One liter. Uh, they one don't sell anything less than one liter in this uh, October <laughs> first time. Okay. Yeah, after your uh, very successful uh, teaching, research, as well as uh, doing a, completing a PhD, everything, uh, after completing in the Turbo Machines Laboratory, you joined, or uh, shall I say, you are forced to join the uh, Ocean Engineering Department. No, not that way, but uh, something really happened, you know, at that time, the director was uh, Professor P. V. Indreshan, and the head of the laboratory was Professor Raju. So, Prohindration is uh, one person who wanted uh, the different faculty from different departments to work together and take up major projects for industries as uh, interdisciplinary projects. Mm -hmm. So, he was giving a thrust. In this process, he formed a number of uh, interdisciplinary research groups. Uh, research groups from consumer faculty from electrical, mechanical, civil, computer science, etc. When uh, they were uh, taking a lot of project, industrial projects like uh, the MICO project in uh, 
Sivaganga and all that. So they were doing that. And uh, at that time, there was a, a special interest on renewable energy from the oceans. And uh, Prof. Indraisen uh, felt that if at all anybody could do the work on uh, ocean energy, it could be only IIT Petras Oceaning Center and we should take the initiative. So he took the interest to call for a formation of a group of interested faculty to work on renewable energy sources from the ocean. So from the Togo Missionary side, myself and Venkat Royal were, we volunteered to work on the design of pumps and turbines aspects of both ocean thermal energy and uh, wave energy. And there were people from uh, Ocean Engineering Center like Professor Bain and an instrumentation group uh, like yourself and uh, Professor Bhattacharya and uh, civil engineering group uh, people, people, Professor Aramindan was very, very senior. Electrical group, uh, Professor Lashmi Narayana and uh, uh, Jagdesh Kumar. They were all uh, involved. So we started working on very, very uh, preliminary designs of uh, ocean thermal and this to start with. And at that time, the government of India started the new department of uh, ocean development under the Ministry of Science and Technology. Dr. Kasim, who went to Antarctica for the first uh, time, taking the group from us, uh, was made the secretary. And uh, Professor Indreshan was always in touch with him and then uh, Professor uh, Indreshan uh, said that uh, we are going to start this initiative and uh, Dr. Kasim said he will support that. So at that time, the Ministry of uh, or the Department of Non-Conventional Energy Source also was there who were doing interest on ocean energy. So from these two departments of Ocean, in, uh, ocean Development and Ministry of Non-Commercial Energy Sources, Professor Indraisen arranged some funding to be given and formulated, a, created a cell called Ocean Energy Cell as a part of the Ocean Engineering Center of IIT Metras with industry faculty. So at that time, because we were taking active part from the mechanical engine group on pumps and turbines aspects of both the wave energy and this thing. And uh, he was also requesting us to develop the, uh, or to complete the uh, wave maker installation at that time which was uh, bought from uh, Germany and uh, the installation was delayed. As a person uh, interested in turbo machinery, especially there was a special uh, uh, bi-directional airflow unidirectional turbine called Wells turbine which was of tremendous interest for the WMG program. I wanted to work further on that. So we volunteered to commission that WMG, way maker in Ocean Center. So first, our job was, uh, my job was to commission, as a faculty of mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. I offered support to commission that way maker, which was commissioned uh, in about six months, we worked day and night. Then Professor Indirishan said, uh, Ravindran, uh, now we know, because there were no mechanical engineers as part of the faculty of ocean engineering at that time. They were all only civil engineers, uh, structural engineers and uh, instrumentation group uh, headed by you. So there was no mechanical engineer uh, there. So he said, we need you. I was a bit hesitating, being that I had research students working in Tawang laboratory. Then they said you could be a uh, adjunct faculty and all. Then when this funding came specifically from both the ministries to create a cell, he wanted somebody to head that and he wanted me. I was a bit reluctant, but he forced me to appear for the interview, even though I didn't apply. So I was given the opportunity to start this uh, activity on renewable energy from the oceans. And uh, we could recruit more younger faculty, research staff from other IITs also, from IIT Karpo, for example. And then uh, we started a major activity to study the different aspects of wave energy conversion. The system which is uh, practically useful for India for the type of wave climate we have in India. The components of that system, where we select the system called oscillating water color system, 
there was work for optimizing the hydrodynamic shape of that uh, wave absorbing which converts the energy from the wave from the waves to the air trapped in a chamber under uh, submersible whatever then from the air to a mechanical shaft through a turbine which is this uh, bidirectional airflow turbine then a generator for it which will convert this mechanical energy into electrical energy and pump out to the grid so we had to design the total loop so even though Professor Indrasen was a bit uh, in a hurry to do that we recommended that we have three research groups independently to work on the hydrodynamic aspect of energy conversion wave to water air hydrodynamic part of it then the mechanical turbine machine aspect of the design of a special turbine for pneumatic to mechanical conversion and advice from uh, electrical engineers to select the right type of machinery to convert cheap and rugged machinery to convert uh, mechanical to electrical engineering. So we had three different research topics even to PhD students and we did a very good work and based on that confidence then we told Prasindra Eisen we can go for a field plant and we selected a site at Wellington, Kerala. We built one, one of the first of its kind in the world you know to generate 150 kilowatts. That was also a very big le learning process for us because it consists of a Kaizen, 3000 tons in weight. We built it on the offshore, uh, on the uh, harbor, William Harbor, towed it to the site and uh, seated it at 10 meters. Our first attempt failed because of many reasons we didn't have the right tug. We used some uh, prefabricated technology for slabs connecting them. It started leaking. So probably you could not also get contractors who can do yes. this so type of Professor Raju used his contact with Larsen Tubro. He said it's a national program, so they have to help us. Mm -hmm. So like that, uh, uh, the vice president of Larsen Tubro, Dr. Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna was there, and he agreed even though it was not a profitable business for them, it was a uh, yeah, technology demonstration capability of Larson to pro for this project. First of its kind, a yeah, Kaizen, fabricated and f floated out and then rest of the equipments uh, assembled on it, built a bridge to the shore which has seated 50 uh, meters away from the near breakwater. So that was also a tremendous uh, learning process and demonstration capability by IIT Madras on all the aspects. That. That's how I got involved. Then, uh, when we did that, uh, uh, Professor uh, Indrasen said uh, we want you to permanent. I was on deputation from mechanical to uh, this thing. Then he said, no, we want you to permanently be in Washington Center. So I became a permanent faculty of Washington Center. And uh, at that time only, uh, also we had commissioned the second stage of uh, uh, German uh, support to us. We expanded our facility to include uh, multi-element waymaker. We formed a group of multidisciplinary faculty from IIT, Washington Center, your group and uh, Sundari Urban's group doing the sexual connections and uh, we did the uh, mechanical part of the uh, Institute group running the sophisticated uh, wave making facility, three dimensional wave making facility it was full of hydraulics, very complicated system of first of its kind installed and that, uh, at that time it was a uh, first thing which happened that Two million German marks were used to buy an equipment not from Germany. Yes. We bought that from Denmark. Denmark. So that was also another thing we could negotiate. I was head of the department. We could convince the uh, German representative who was staying with us, one Dr. Goex. So we want the best equipment which is affordable. The German equipment was very, very expensive. An extension of a four meter flume would have been very expensive, which is hydraulic based. This was a servo motor based one. So that's how we got that equipment and uh, it was a cooperation. We gave, IIT gave 20 million rupees for the associated structural facilities and the infrastructure. They gave us 2 million uh, German marks for the specially imported equipment. That's how we could commission this special facility which is unique in this part of the world. Yeah. In fact, uh, Ocean Engineering uh, Center at that time was probably the only one of its kind in Southeast Asia. Yes, true. Which uh, had most of the facilities uh, under one roof. 
That too, even Germany did not have, you know. Yes. And you see, there were facilities under commercial or private, uh, this thing, like uh, National uh, Hydronics Laboratory in uh, Trondheim. Yeah. They were all privately owned uh, laboratories. Under a university system, I think this was the first of its kind of the unique facilities, so many facilities yeah. under one group. I think that's what uh, success of our initiative in IIT Madras and the Germans supported us very much. I think uh, that was the brainchild of Professor Indraisen to develop this and uh, he had special interest in oceans because yeah. uh, before he came to IIT Madras, he was uh, in uh, Centre for uh, Applied Research in Electronics. There he has worked a lot of things on underwater uh, acoustics, electronics, etc. So he had a special interest in Washington Center. Yes. Even after his retirement, he came uh, and stayed with us as a faculty of Washington yes. Center. I think a lot of great support for him. He developed this interdisciplinary group. I now I think uh, we have a lot of mechanical engineers and uh, yeah. other people in Washington Center. Excellent. I think that was the vision of Professor Indira, and we should. Uh, yeah. we should He's uh, truly a multidisciplinary. Yes. Yes. Coming back again to the Bay Basin, I think no wonder uh, the president of Germany himself came okay. and uh, yes. inaugurated it. Uh, yes, yeah, that was one of our uh, best achievements because till that time, Ocean Center never had any recognition, even within India. Yeah. Even though we had done one or two projects for uh, ONGC and all that, mm -hmm. the whole facility, the uniqueness of Ocean Center was not known to anybody outside of Ocean Center. So uh, we said uh, we uh, requested the German uh, Department of uh, GTZ, German uh, Agency for Technical Cooperation, cooperation yes. to support us and they were also thrilled that, you know, they could bring the president to inaugurate such a very important uh, example of their cooperation to us. Even though Ocean Center came very late into the German aid program and we have become uh, such a uh, big advertisement for them or uh, this thing, we have achieved a very major result within a short time. That was the happiness of German agency also. They would like to also support us. That was a very good thing. Uh, it was uh, also a big uh, uh, news for the German media. Yes. Where the president came, and one of the uh, aspects which they projected was such a facility is not available in Germany. Yes. Whereas the government has supported one to be created. True. In and India. that was the greatness of Germany. They yeah. agreed yeah. to that. Otherwise, right. normally a, a donor agency never allows uh, such a major equipment money to be spent outside Germany. They like to use it for their own industrial support. Right. But this was something when we convinced them, they accepted that. I think yeah. that was a very magnanimous uh, uh, way uh, in which they accepted. Okay. I think the Kaison uh, again, it was rebuilt uh, yes. the second time. Yes, after the first failure, when uh, we could not uh, place it at the right place, at the right uh, tide, uh, we, uh, it got damaged also during the peak uh, monsoon time. We designed a stronger uh, Kaison, a little bit uh, more of a uh, more surplus uh, uh, strength, that is factor of safety was slightly okay. more. And uh, this was slightly uh, uh, constructed in a slightly different uh, uh, procedure that the only the basic raft was uh, built on the uh, shore, sure. on the beach. Then we pulled the raft into the sea and then built the superstructure of nearly 20 meters in the floating mode. Mm -hmm. The whole raft was yeah. floating and that was a big challenge because uh, when you pour concrete on one side because of the floating mode it used a tilt. So keeping the right angle and the strength and the uniformity was a big challenge to Lars and Tobro. But still it was a very good uh, demonstration of the yeah. new capability of building this huge Kaisan which was blasted with 3,000 tons of sand to make it sit on the floor. Mm -hmm. It became a gravity structure, no foundations were uh, added and all. It was just uh, sitting on a prepared ruble bed, which was prepared by divers. And uh, we built the turbine and the uh, generator afterwards, after building a connecting bridge where there was no crane. It was purely, it was another learning experience how to build a 50 meters long bridge from the breakwater to the Kaisan sitting in 10 meter water depth. Okay. So without a big crane, without a hardly crane of two tons capacity, so slowly, like uh, they built this uh, road, railway bridges, now we built yeah. extension extension, we built over the oceans. <laughs> yes, I think the second Kaisan uh, worked uh, probably uh, about 15 years later. Yes, that's one of the longest uh, working we have the plant in the whole world. Okay. The Belfast people started uh, 
one, but that fell into the sea mm. within about uh, two, three years. So that way ours was the longest surviving. We commissioned in 1989, uh, uh, that was the last day, it was New Year Eve success mm. uh, on the December 31st. It was a, a, it's a happiness. Uh, after the initial failure, it was a very great joy for all of us when you seated it properly and then uh, slowly we added the turbine and generator, we pumped power to the grid. Mm. Then after the initial system was uh, commissioned with the uh, induction generator, that is an uh, induction motor, very conventional rugged machine, Kirloskar machine, run at a speed higher than the synchronous speed to work as a generator, cheapest possible of generator. But that was very stiff, you know, the torques we can see within 3% when speed the power went from 0 to 100 percent. Oh. The wave character did not match that mm -hmm. very much. We looked up for a very simple and rugged machine. So slowly we know the uh, faculty from uh, electron, like this one, Jayadish Kumar, yeah. he started a variable speed induction motor, the control of the speed uh, in line with the power availability from the waves. We did lot of research on the electrical machine also, plus which slowly changed the type of uh, turbine from uh, adjustable guide blades, we have put adjustable guide blades, then we have fixed guide blades. Then we said that during monsoon the power ability is so high, we designed for average power. The peak power was nearly 10 times that of the average power. So we said uh, why we should lose that peak power. So we changed the type of uh, design of the turbine from reaction turbine, low pressure reaction to high pressure impulse turbine similar to the work done by Japanese, we are cooperation with Germany. Then we involved uh, uh, the faculty from Ernard's department, uh, the professor uh, Shantakumar, I think you are right. He came and he developed a statistic also the, for the bidirectional air flow in his lab. So it was a really a, a wholehearted cooperation from faculty, we developed new machines. We developed and we attained a very high uh, overall efficiency compared to anybody else in the world. Only uh, our uh, uh, sadness is that we could not put that in the harbor that was being built in the Valletra harbor uh, okay. near Kolam. There was a harbor project coming, not Valletra, um, near Kolam. Uh, but uh, they said that we are having uh, stones which are very cheaply available in the nearby hills. So our Kaizan was little more expensive. So we had planned all this that this path will be part of the breakwater, as a multi-purpose breakwater, that we could not achieve because they could get, because they still hills were available in Kerala to break. <laughs> so in the environment it was not nice, but they said this is the cheapest way, we have the money only for this. So even though it was the best wave device we could develop, we could not put it in a commercial uh, uh, production mode. Now speaking about the economics of, uh, you know, wave energy, uh, I think it is definitely not uh, comparable with the conventional energy. That is probably the case with any any uh, yes. you know. Yes, uh, that is true. Energy. Because uh, the two main reasons is that uh, that the wave energy varies. Wave energy potential of the wave varies continuously from uh, very low, almost zero during calm period during the uh, non -mon in between months like December and all that, it is very lull, you can see uh, the, it likes a lake. Compared to the monsoon, it is June, July in Kerala, it is peak, we have 6 meter waves and uh, 7 meter waves. So it is quite high, the ratio peak to average power is more than uh, 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. We have to design the structure to withstand the peak waves, which is there for a few days in a year, whereas you have to design the equipment for the average power which is it. So, that is the most difficult thing in a wave energy device in a country like India. Okay. That's why we designed our system as a multi-purpose device where this Kaizen, when you put number of them in a row, it becomes a breakwater. Yeah. Instead of a stone breakwater with tetrapods, which dissipates the energy of the waves to create a calm water behind mm -hmm. in a harbor, we said this will absorb and convert into electricity. Mm -hmm. So this way it will we are multi-purpose, we can offset the extra cost mm -hmm. from the cost of breakwater. That's what we wanted to put in the uh, Nindag report. Okay. And uh, somehow they said that still it is not uh, cheaper for them compared to stone breakwater. So, in spite of our best effort to convince the uh, uh, fishes, ministry which was building, it was a fishing harbor. Okay. We could not do that.
but we are very confident that is the best device anywhere in the world, OWC with our generators. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, who came in later, and first thing I should pay our respect to him, he is no more. He was working on so many simulations of optimizing the various components, electrical, mechanical, turbine, hydrodynamics, etc. He was working much longer period as a faculty. He came from NAOT to IIT faculty and then uh, he has come with a very solid modeling proof that the uh, combined system could be cheaper at any time. So he was negotiating with some people abroad for uh, the project and uh, somebody was even willing to take his advice for certain funding. Mm -hmm. They asked him not to publish, he said no, this technology is available, is to be used by everybody who is interested in the renewable energy, so he was not willing to sell this or restrict this okay. technology to a particular agency. So he didn't do that, he didn't uh, give this technology to them and uh, Unfortunately, he passed away uh, because of sudden illness mm -hmm. due to cancer. So I think uh, that initiative has come down to this. So we are waiting still for a oil price to increase or uh, <laughs> this price to come down. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, later on um, the power produced has also been used for uh, desalination work. Yes, um, in order to demonstrate the multiple capability, the Willingham Harbour uh, has a lot of fishermen who use a lot of ice mm. and also they need drinking water. We are doing the previous to the monsoon, the earlier period, they have severe drought in this uh, fishing harbors. So we had uh, put a desalination plant run by purely wave energy mm. and demonstrated that we could give them every day at least 5,000 liters of water from the small plant okay. purely run by wave energy and was running for quite some time. What I think is um, the, uh, the uh, Total expenditure on this, like security, because that is on the harbor, mm -hmm. then maintenance, and because this is in the uh, corrosive environment, so that was a bit high, even though it could have been done. So we wanted the Kerala government to take over. Somehow they didn't want to take over because of the expense. They said we don't have a budget. So after we were very confident that we have enough technology, uh, demonstration capability, uh, demonstration done, and then any day we can design a commercial system. We said, okay, we'll stop and then we said we will dismantle the system. So after nearly 25 years, we have dismantled the system. Yeah, see, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, you know, put in so much of effort. A lot of technology, a uh, lot of, uh, you know, knowledge has been generated from it. But ultimately, you know, it could not be used on a, on a commercial scale. Yeah. Even if it's a little expensive. Yeah, that is a tragedy in India, I will say, uh, is my personal opinion. You see, tidal power plant, the first ever plant was commissioned in uh, France, Rans King, 1966. Fifty years it is working, still working. Initially, uh, it was uh, known it is expensive. The barrier, the civil engineering construction cost of the barrier is expensive. But now, having seen how much energy it has produced, and now people want to build it. But India, which has got a tremendous potential in Gulf of Gambe, Gulf of Kutch, and feasibly studies have been done for the last 20 years, repeatedly. Mm. The government never took a decision to go for a tidal power okay. plant, which would have helped the Saurashtra region, Maharashtra region very much. There were very clear de uh, designs done for a 800 megawatt plant in Gulf of Kutch oh. 25 years ago. In the Minister of Water Resources, there was a dedicated chief engineer, one Mr. H. R. Sharma, who got frustrated. He went to Mauritius. Really, after having done so much of work. Similarly, we did a feasible study after NAVT was started. Washington said, We ourselves, Professor Raju was the coordinator, we did a feasible study for Sundarbans. We said, We put a small plant, the entire technology will be ours. Three megawatt plant, at the cost of about three crores or four crores with a standby diesel power plant for the hospitals to be installed. Mm. Government, they worked on it for years, they didn't take a decision. So, somehow I feel that there is a reluctance to go for a renewable energy plant in our country. Always quoting that it is expensive, expensive. Expensive from what sense? In a place like Sundarban, when there is no other power available, uh, 
like uh, so, uh, the first uh, the chairman atomic power uh, commission said you know no energy is costly than the position of no energy that our people have never understood okay. and we have been also highlighting the water plant which was later there also similar thing happened they were always asking where is the first plant they want to be commercially viable the same yardstick is not used for all ministries. For example, ISRO, they have put so many rockets which were not commercially viable or it was not technology successful. Yeah. Slowly they have taken uh, 30, 40 years to come to a commercially viable stage. Yeah. That lead time was not going to ocean technology or ocean energy. That is my personal disappointment from the our ministries. Yeah, and it's, it's very strange, you know, sometimes when it comes to uh, political will, mm. it lacks because of, I don't know whether they have no confidence. Always, you know, you can blame that it is not commercially viable, so therefore we are not going to, not going to support. I think it is uh, yes. very unfortunate. We always trust, first we have to prove technical viability first. Yeah. It takes a few years of lead time. Till that is technically feasible, don't ask about commercial viability. Yeah, exactly. Because by that time, maybe the commercial, like deep sea mining, even uh, yesterday's paper, there was a report on deep sea mining. Mm -hmm. We have been working on uh, 20 years, NAV is working on. Slowly, we see that in this 20 years' time, it is becoming viable. Yeah. The cost of the cobalt, nickel, and this thing has gone up. But if we start this technology, we will not be there. We will be demonstrating next year. If we start this technology uh, today, we would have waited another 20 years to mine this. See, this is what our government is not accepting, our understanding. Always there is a lead to prove the technology till it is proven commercially viable. Okay, uh, let us hope that there will be some <laughs> change yes. in the mindset of yes. uh, the government. Yes. Okay, let us probably start with the NIOT <laughs> next yes. phase. Uh, I think at the top for starting a National Institute of Technology or Ocean Technology for quite some time. Yes. Because um, National Institute of Oceanography is there. Mm. 66 onwards. Yeah, <laughs> started long back, but then there is nothing on technology. Uh, every time there is something is talked about, uh, the, the people, I mean, uh, the, the government or the department has to come to IIT and uh, probably the Navy to some extent. So then this. Uh, National Institute of Ocean Technology was thought of. Probably again, Indiration was uh, behind it. And uh, East Coast was taken as uh, one of the places where it is likely to come up. And then, considering all aspects, especially the proximity of IIT Ocean Engineering Department, uh, it has been decided to establish the center in, uh, in Chennai to start with an IIT itself. It's a very wise decision, of course. Yes. Both an IOT as well as IIT got benefited yes. because of it. I think you are in the thick of uh, you yes. know, the entire uh, establishment of the institute. Mm -hmm. I think you should elaborate a little on that. Yeah. Ever since uh, the Ministry of Ocean Development started in 1982, uh, there was talk about ocean oil. Dr. Kasim felt the need for this. Till that time, you know, from 66 when uh, people started talking about oceanography, ocean technology were need was not appreciated till the offshore platform started coming. Yeah. The entire technology for offshore uh, uh, oil uh, exploration was higher technology. There was nothing indigenously available. For every small thing we had to pay through our nose and ONGC slowly started developing its own core strength from its younger team engineers. And uh, another thing is that the, the people who knew oceans, the naval people, they never understood the deep water technology. There was no need for them to understand deep water technology. For them, the submarine operation depth was less than 300 meters, so they were happy. So the authorities or the advisors for the government authorities never felt the importance of developing a capability in deep sea technologies or offshore engineering proper. Yeah. Till they realize, okay, offshore oil is one, but there are so many other things which are more, also equally important in offshore engineering. 
other than offshore oil platforms. Mm. I think that came known to them only after washing center was started. Yes. When even before the facilities could be commissioned, I think uh, you were the first to do demonstrate the launching capability of offshore platform indianously from our own platform. So people started understanding your capability is being built in Washington Center and there's a need to go to other unknown areas of uh, deep water technology. So that way again, Professor Indiration's idea was that he had a very close uh, 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 personal uh, equation with Dr. Kasim because I think for Indiration daughter went to Antarctica. Yeah. And uh, at, that, at that time when Dr. Kasim proposed in the first instance, I think in the end of uh, sixth fire plan or something, they prepared a totally a greenfield institute budget with multiple, I think about uh, 80 or 100 crores. Government said, no, no, we don't have money to start a yeah, greenfield institution, so they just uh, closed it. Then it was lying low. Then Professor Ramarao came, N.P. Ramarao, who was the Secretary of Science and Technology, who was also in charge of Ocean Development, Department of Ocean Development. So our uh, Professor Raju and uh, Professor Swami, who was the then director, uh, when they went for discussion sometime with the DSC, he said, uh, we should take over. I think Professor Raju was the main trust that we should have a Institute of Ocean Technology and uh, we should do that. And they said, we don't have much money. So then the director uh, offered that, we offer the administrative support. It could be started within the IIT campus. They can use all the facilities of IIT in the R&D, because it's an interdisciplinary uh, technology development uh, institution. They can use all our existing facilities. So we don't have to create immediately a huge infrastructure. And uh, other administrative support we can give, security, administration, and other things. So you give us minimum money, we'll start. Then they said, oh, where is the director? We said, we'll also give one of our faculty. With that only, it came into being. Uh, SFC was promoted, uh, submitted by Dr. Ramaro. And for the first year, the budget was hardly 40 lakhs. IIT accepted that. Okay, give us 40 lakhs, maybe give us something more for the other two years. The initially, uh, remaining parts of that five year plan, I think seventh five year plan, it was hardly two crores or so for the entire uh, uh, two and a half years or so. IIT accepted that. <coughs> they said, we'll provide our facilities to start. So give us project to individual departments and then we'll start working. That's how the NAOT came into being. Otherwise, the uh, NAOT would not have uh, been. Uh, started at all. So that uh, real, uh, uh, this thing, uh, thanks should go to IIT Madras, the then director and Professor Raju. And uh, uh, it so happened that they recommended my name, that we'll uh, deputy, uh, even without my, they didn't discuss with me. Either. So at that time only the, I just completed my term of head of the department and uh, I was, uh, had more time. They said, oh, okay, we'll give it a minute. Uh, even though it was a surprise to me, it was not discussed with me. I accepted because IHS is committed. So I was thankful for the confidence they had in me. So I said, it's a big challenge starting on ocean technology. So we have to right from the beginning to look for land onwards, you know, right from scratch we have to start. Uh, that was a big challenge. We accepted that and uh, with all the cooperation from the Washington Center and this thing, we started. And then within two years, the secondary ocean development changed. We got Dr. Muthunayam, mm. who was the uh, uh, senior person uh, from ISRO. He came into the oceans and he is a man of the hardware type because they are used to having projects with a time of delivery yeah. with no restraint on expenses, time frame, or always project, time based project. So when he took over in 95, we started in 93, November. Yeah. He said, uh, he told me, Ravindra, no, why not we expand? As long as we are restricted to this one floor in a ICSR building, which built with that 40 lakhs the first year. He said, you will still remain only as a pure R&D. You cannot uh, expand your activity. There are so many different activities to be taken up. And this place is not sufficient. So we should look for a place, at least 50 acres. Look for a place. So we took a policy decision, okay, look for a place 
and build it. As he said, you know, we should build it within two years. We don't have even a land, you know, at that time. We didn't have the money. But we took this challenge and then um, we asked the government of Tamil Nadu to give us some land. They uh, wanted to give us some land very far away or give us only a few uh, grounds, you know, less than an acre for the institute. We said, no, give us the, uh, a land which nobody else wants. So we got this garbage dump area in Pallikarna, which was a marshy land with seven feet of water. He said, okay, give us, we'll develop it. So at that time, the Commissioner of Land Administration, Mr. Narayana, yes, very nice gentleman, who later became Chief Secretary, within a sh very short time, he allotted 50 acres of land within uh, Madras city, which was a very big uh, gesture on the part of the Thamanadu government. And now we could build this campus in 18 months, as required by <laughs> our secretary, and uh, that was the first time we committed in writing to a planning commission. There will be no cost escalation and time escalation and we did that. So there was a tremendous appreciation from everybody concerned in planning commission, everybody. And that was one of the nicest campus we have developed from a garbage dump area with so much of facilities. Even before the physical commission, we started work there. Like deep sea mining technology, all works were started. Many projects were started in the ocean apart from OTEC. Uh, data wide program deep sea mining technology, marine instrumentation, you know, the activities there. Then later we added the data by program and the, we built ships for our sir, go into the sea because without going into the sea, what do they learn? Mm -hmm. So we said we should survey and take samples from deep sea. So we built two small ships, later we built two big ships, which became uh, really uh, the best ships in our part of the country is the technology demonstration vessel, okay. which goes almost uh, to southern oceans, to yeah. 60 degrees south and all that, which has gone. So such capability we have developed in a short time. Yeah. Yes, that's how the ocean technology. And I took retirement in 2004. I said 10 years <laughs> we did all this. The budget increased from 10, 40 lakhs per year, first year, to more than 100 crores per year when I retired. And we had about uh, 300 people working for the institute. Nice campus, nice campus, beautiful, with excellent facilities, technology device, capability device, I said it was the time. Okay. You know, the, uh, the, to tell you something about the, the, the technology demonstrators uh, done by the NIOT. Yes. For uh, example, even starting with water, desalination. Yes. And, um, uh, the first project which we came into actual uh, service to the humanity in, in, in India is the data by program in which uh, we have deployed data buoys floating around in the uh, Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal, number of them, 12 of them. They have all the ocean parameters and the mm -hmm. air parameters above the ocean. One of the important requirements for predicting our uh, rainfall, uh, cyclones and uh, um, storms was that the air sea interaction, the weather or the yes. air parameters just above the sea. Mm. We didn't have any uh, offshore stations though earlier. So we had to depend only from islands like Andaman or Lashwari. In between we didn't have any measurement stations. So IMD was handicapped, Met department was handicapped. Mm. So this data boys go very, very well in information on the energy coming from the oceans, which are being transferred to the air or the atmosphere and change into rain or hurricanes or monsoon. So that became a very important contribution. Within, I think, uh, 97, we commissioned that. Our uh, whole issue was started in 93. That was one of the first solid contribution to our society to understand the oceans, understand, safeguard the coastal population from hazards like hurricanes and storms. That was the first one. Then we started the ocean thermal energy conversion against the opposition by the Ministry of non Commercial Energy Source because that we are supposed to do it is not economical. They are opposing, opposing, opposing. Actually, our ministry, Dr. Mandrayan, fought and took up this project with so much of opposition from many people. I, I don't want to name the people or the organization we are opposing. When whole thing, it was again a two-year project. Uh, 
you know that we draw water from 1000 meter water depth through a vertical pipeline hanging from the barge yes. where all the equipment, power plant equipments are there. All the plants, all the equipments about the barge, specially built barge, Sagar Sakti, which was built in uh, Goa shipyard, within 18 months was tested. Only the cold water pipe could not be tested because we have to go to the ocean to okay. testing it. It is tragedy that our country doesn't have any offshore crane even today. Mm. We have to handle 200 tons of the anchor for the cold water pipe. So, because like ONGC and all, they hire these cranes from offshore for that season between December to April. Mm. Then they go back to Dubai or Singapore. So, when I went to Singapore and asked for these people to come and work, they said, yes, we erect with warranty. But the defense department totally refused to give security clearance for this. And he said, I want an advance payment of $1 million for the entire contract because the payment delays are uh, unacceptable to me. Mm. I have seen from other experience, so I want it. These two conditions were uh, refused by the ministry. They said, use some other equipment which is available. We have to hire an airframe without a, even a crane possibility using a winch which failed, which was supposed to have been tested by, supposed to have been tested by Lloyds. So we lost the cold water pipe. So everybody who was objecting to the project mm -hmm. said, we know this what will happen. It was a very, very unsympathetic uh, remark by the officials and other ministries. We felt very sad. And out of, I don't know whether I should say that, total project about 30 crores, this damage was only 5 crores, the globe. Okay. Renewed, because the entire platform, everything was tested and ready. Mm. They said we won't give any more money. So we have to close the project. That was one of the saddest part of my career in NAOT. But we yes. didn't stop there, yes. Yeah, it's very sad, you know. Yes. Um, uh, some, I don't know whether it is bureaucrats or uh, technocrats, they take decisions uh, without uh, looking at every aspect and then... Uh, so, when other ministries were given so much time and money to prove the capability, yes. they expect our first plant to be commercially successful, commercial successful, one megawatt, which would have been the first commercial plant in the whole world, they didn't give us a chance to prove. Okay. Except one common failed, that's the point of the project. Mm. The then finance minister wrote mm. good money for a bad project. It was very, very sickening to read. From the finance minister. What does he understand? Yeah, that's what. Very uh, unsympathetic mark and this thing. And based on that, we were not given any money. So the entire 30 crores was left unutilized, scrapped. So, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the real loss is only about 5 but crores. Yes. Not, not even. Uh, if we have allowed that crane to be have been hired, the right equipment to be hired at the right time, we could have done that first time. It was, we are not allowed. So we were uh, asked to fight with the uh, folded hands. You have to work with whatever is available. <laughs> and we failed. Okay. So, but we didn't um, keep quiet. We took up the other projects of uh, deep sea mining to mine polymetallic nodules which are lying on the surface of the seabed at 5,000 meter depth. Yeah. And they are 2,000 kilo, kilometers away from the Kanyagbari, South Central Indian Ocean Basin. So, we said we program uh, in steps. First, you know, we develop a crawler. And because we have never worked uh, more than 300, nobody has touched the bottom and worked there. So, I said we should demonstrate capability to work about 150 to 200 meters, develop a crawler machine which will move on the seabed, mm. do some work and pump that yeah, soil up. So our technology was that we pick up the nodules, crush it and send it through a hose, flexible riser. So we wanted to prove in stages. So that was proven first. We developed a crawler first time in, uh, in this part of the world, demonstrated uh, after it took in, mm -hmm. then re-demonstrated 500 meters, first 150 meters, then 500 meters on the west coast. then. We deployed, uh, because the nodules are available only in 5,000 meters. Okay. So to prove that at 500 meters, we made artificial nodules and picked up these nodules 
capability of picking up these nodules, crushing and pumping with demonstrated. So all those uh, sub-stages have gone. So now we are designing uh, the NIOT uh, is designing the final version for 6,000 meter, which is capable of pumping something like uh, 8 kg of uh, nodules per hour. Okay. With a slurry of about 10 percent by volume, which is uh, pumping through a hose 6,000 meters long, yeah. getting power supply also through a cable 6,000 meters long. So, how to install it, how to recover it, it is a big technology. Yeah. So, slowly our uh, engineers are working and uh, we are hopeful that the first uh, the crawler will be demonstrated in 2018 and uh, the full integrated test will be in 2020. That is our project. So, we start work something like 10 years ago. 15 years ago, preliminary work was started, but uh, it is worked on. It is a very tough technology because components are all not available yeah. internationally. So, we have to develop most of the thing ourselves to prove the success of these things in deep sea water because the environment is very difficult. 600 times atmospheric pressure, you know, yeah. 1000 times uh, denser than air. Yes. So, the forces are high, depths are uh, unreachable. So, the no component is proven in 6000 meters so far industrially. So, we buy equipments and provide special casings to withstand and test them at 900 bar, 50 percent more pressure. So, that facility has been created, infrastructure. So, these are the new type of things. Such a facility does not uh, exist anywhere in this part of the world. Even defense, you know, they have only 600 meters depth testing. NPL has, you know, that, like that. So, building and creating facility itself is a technology by itself. Then to go and survey this, we have developed a remotely operated vehicle. Now, people know Titanic and people have gone in a people do not know in India, we have developed a much better version to go to deeper waters. We have published, but now people are not really appreciating. Yeah. So, capability and we have done uh, underwater ROV to work in Antarctica. We went under the ice and bore at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So, these capabilities we have developed, very unique facilities which was never existing in our country. So, we are enabled is very proud of this capability. And now, after the tsunami, yeah. it was said that, yeah. yes, 2004, there was a strong need felt, understandably, that we should have a warning system. You know, it is very difficult to have a very long advanced system. Even two hours warning will be good enough. So, we have put tsunami warning system, that is a special sensors, you are aware, pressure sensors, which sense the surface variations of that. Once we recognize that, nature immediately gives a warning through our database system, acoustically from the bottom 4000 meters to the surface buoy, from there through satellite communication to our standard database system, we are able. So, we have made four such systems installed on the Arabian Sea because that is the direction in which the most of our uh, uh, tsunami waves are coming periodically. So, apart from US, we are the only country manufacturing these uh, devices. I think you have tested some of them also, the yeah. pressure sensors. So, I anybody has proven capability to prove this special equipment in deeper waters, which was never there in our country. Yeah. We, they were all imported. So, we are slowly indigenizing this capability. In fact, you know, it is a totally unexplored area with not much information, not much technology, but I think NIOD has, uh, can be proud that, uh, especially you can be so proud that uh, you could achieve, you know, most of these things in a very, very short time. Not that, uh, and with very limited resources. That is true. Also, in addition to this deep sea technology, so also we are putting social benefits like you know, uh, we also have biotechnology related activities. Mm -hmm. For fishermen, we give technology of uh, lobster yeah. being grown in uh, cages in two meter water depth. Yes. So they don't have to go into deeper waters and we demonstrated in uh, or gave technology to fishermen in. Uh, near Rathutukudi, Tharuvakkala and the Yeravadi and all that, we gave them baskets which will survive the uh, waves and currents, winds. So, it is in two meters, people can walk or they can uh, go and pick up this. It is like a bank, you know, where these lobsters are there. Whenever you need money, going to be, it sells per kilo 800 rupees, 1000 rupees, those days, uh, before 10 years. So, people have can save diesel, but only thing is, they come in, grow easily in shallow, uh, clean waters. 
So unless people maintain clean beaches, mm. we cannot grow lobsters or uh, mud crabs. So okay. this technology also we have developed. Now we are working on uh, uh, medicine from the sea, that is uh, biodiesel also. It's like many activities. Now new technology now uh, we have ventured into is that the aquaculture farmer land is polluting the land, you know, they are losing the uh, coastal aquifers. Yeah. So now, like Norway has done, we go into the deeper sea, put huge cages, yeah. 10 meters, 20 meter diameter cages, and uh, 50 meters high, and grow fishes there, big fishes which go up to 30 kg, 50 kg. We already done this in Mandabam and Andaman area. Okay. And we have demonstrated about 12 cages. So now this is going to be a major blue water economy for our country. That you know, we like to develop this offshore fish farming technology which was never existent. Yeah. So that for that, you know, we need a lot of mechanical design, like you know, offshore designs of these cages mm -hmm. which have survived mm -hmm. in our monsoon weather conditions. So moorings, feeding devices. So really, even though it's a uh, fishes related, it's a uh, interdisciplinary technology. Yeah. So that actually also has come up and we have put our office in uh, Andamans yeah. to study the uh, uh, island environment and give them support. Survey, we do a lot of other engineering work which uh, of course the uh, Ocean Center also is doing. So like that, uh, but most of the projects are engineering oriented, not uh, stop with R&D, mm -hmm. provide a yeah. solution to a problem in which we can harvest the resources from the sea. Either it is energy or uh, food or save the people from natural hazards Perhaps. like hurricanes, tsunami, mm. and then keep a complete uh, warning system for uh, monsoon predictions. So yeah. these are all the services being offered. There is something very unique about an IoT that uh, it is not just uh, the R&D alone, but yes. uh, you always demonstrate it in the, in yes. the field. Yes, that is the thing, you know, yeah. uh, and like NIO, you know, people have been studying for yes. research sake. Mm. They study about the oceans, understand oceans, but we do engineering projects for the benefit of the people. So that is the difference. So we need a lot more people, but uh, we need support, but that, that sort of support is not yet coming yeah, in see, large numbers. Ocean in the, in the uh, is something which is totally neglected. Yes. In fact, we don't even have sufficient data. Only yes. after you know yes. the data yes. boys started yes. yes. uh, collecting data. Only we have something like you know some data is available at least. So right from that, yes, yes. even fisheries are fully exploited. Yeah. There's a joke saying that you know one Indian waters fish die of old age because they are never <laughs> caught. Yes, <laughs> because we don't have deep sea uh, fishing trawlers. Yeah. We don't have deep sea fishing harbors. There's a policy lacking, lacuna there yeah, for deep sea fishing. It's a big tragedy. I mean, I mm. Recently, I there was a conference of uh, uh, one forum called the Forum for uh, Integrated uh, National Security mm. for the country, uh, organized by, uh, supported by Minister of External Affairs and uh, Norway. And there we are talking about ocean security. See, we are working now all over the place. Our ships go all over the place. Now Chinese are watching. Wherever we go, Chinese are behind us. Mm. We have to provide security. How are these offshore uh, activities safe yeah. from these people? People have totally neglected the threat coming from deep sea. Okay. See, when you go to deep sea mining, we are 2,000 kilometers away from coast. coast yes. Any health emergency, we don't have support. Any threat, security threat, we don't. So, in some of our ships, you carry gunmen hired from abroad, paying through our nose. So that aspect also is not being taken seriously so far by the government. I mean, now only they are talking about it. So we have 7,000 kilometers of coast. How are we protecting them? And like the 2611 yeah. disaster can take yes. place anytime. Right. How are we protecting? So we should understand the oceans. How do we protect our coast? Not only look for resources, how do we protect these uh, science and technology activities, yeah. resource okay. harvesting activities? Great wealth, wealth is in lying, our, below. lying below. First, we don't know, we don't know how to protect them. Yeah, that's correct. Others are harvesting. I think it should be a, a complete uh, policy change is required. Yes, I think Washington needs much more investment yeah. 
and in terms of finance and manpower. I think Oceans, till the Oceans Centre, nobody knew what was Oceans. Correct, yeah. Nobody knew what was offshore structure even. Yes. <laughs> so Oceans Centre was the uh, beginning, but a small group we are doing within the institutions and doing concerns. But this set of activity, 2,000 kilometers away, we need institutions, we need infrastructure like big ships, standby ships, helicopters. See, we go to Antarctica, we take two helicopters with us. Mm -hmm. But when you go to CIOB, which is also far away, it is 20 days journey, we don't take helicopters. Yeah. We take all our risk. So we need investment, we need more ships, more supporting systems, more manpower. Other more important is the policy making that officials, they don't exactly. understand the oceans. Yes. More important, we don't teach anything to our school boys. Exactly. In one of the colleges, we asked, how are the waves made? We are creating awareness about oceans. We just asked, how do you get waves? Ships are moving, so we get waves. <laughs> this is the knowledge of people about waves. We, nobody knows. Even the yeah. teachers, school teachers do not know about oceans. Yeah, so we have to have an awareness, even at the school level, school about level. the oceans. Then only our officials will know what oceans are. Yeah. So that's why I said, way forward is to educate our uh, policy making uh, bodies. Officials yeah, I think it should start in the school itself because now there is absolutely nothing. Now the student uh, 1200 when he passes, you know, I don't think he knows anything about ocean. I <laughs> tell you, this engineering college student said waves are made by ships. <laughs> so okay, I think uh, I know you can go for hours <laughs> yeah. talking about NIT and this program. Why did he suddenly uh, decide to say? Yeah, I was 60, uh, even though there was a request both by Director, you know, Professor Anand came and requested me to come back as a Professor Emeritus, you made a request formally, the government of India also said that, I said, uh, the last 12 years of uh, NAOT, it was a tremendous work, even my wife was complaining that I don't have time even to talk to her, <laughs> okay. really, I used to be travel so much, day and night spending the time, so, she said, let us do something other than technology. Mm -hmm. So, no more coming from a permanent institution. Okay. So, at that time, uh, we were starting a parallel activity of a social service to a tribal community in uh, Dharmavri district uh, in mm -hmm. the reserve forest. Okay. So, with our doctor friends, uh, we were trying to start a hospital. They needed manpower, not only money, but they needed people to work with them. Even though they were willing to stay, but they need a lot of support to collect money, get some approvals, uh, consult the hospital, bring equipments and bring people administratively. So we said we go and help them. And I was also working with uh, Gandhi Gram, designing small, small machines for them yeah. for uh, minimizing the uh, manual effort of uh, rural ladies who are working in some of our uh, okay. spinning, weaving, uh, and Ayurvedic medicine preparations, soap making, etc. So I thought I'll spend more time, something different, and then spend more time with the family because I, which I never was able to spend right from the day one, heavy work. You know, in the Tower Mission Laboratory, LC, I was in charge of major fabrication, erection, yes. and my PhD also was very. And then Washington Center was also a top job expert, erection, lot of facilities. When we came to the NAOT, totally different work. So I thought we'll spend more time at home and then spend time with these people where you see immediate benefit, where ocean technology has got a lot time element for you to see the success. Lead time is there. <laughs> yeah. Even after two years, you don't see the result. Correct. Whereas here, instantly, within few weeks, few months, teaching the small uh, kids who are school dropouts, doing something with their own hands, mm -hmm. repairing a motor, repairing a, a pipeline, water pipeline, welding, yeah. constructing. Uh, we have trained small kids to build uh, uh, masonry, work. masonry work with the compressed bricks without any cement. Yeah. You should see uh, the hospital and the guest house building which they have built. Mm. The kids whom we have seen with 15, 16 we have taught them and they have built, they have become masons. So that really is a real happiness yeah. which It's a different do. type of satisfaction, you know? Yes. I think so it is. Right. Uh, and then we gave them a small machine to decarticate uh, ground at some time they used to they used to sell cheaply because they cannot uh, process them. It's a post processing machine. So when you came the one you see the uh, happiness in the whole village 
that now they are able to use that uh, groundnut because they are able to decorticate they can make uh, chutney they can make sweets uh, they can uh, go and get it crushed and make oil they don't have to sell as a raw material to somebody who sells the product back to them at a three times cost that you know is something capability building now the people who were fellow who did not know how to speak english or anything is the electrician for the eb hmm. for the entire village you have taught them how to rewind motors how to repair pumps how to lay pipeline now all hospital our wiring everything is done by these kids whom we are trained in fact the skill development you know it's a mission of the central government it should happen like this i mean at the at the grassroots level go there and stay with them and then teach them so that you know they uh, are independent uh, and they don't have to depend on anybody else but i like to say something very my bad experience with the so called skill development of tribals i apply for a project with the ministry of science they have special money and lot of money mm-hmm. we said this is what we want to do the school robot kids we want to train and we want a welding machine a lathe and these things and a small dormitory because they walk down from hills they cannot go back they will be with us at least for 3 months okay. so we want to give them some food and shelter a yeah, dormitory accommodation you know the committee of science and technology came sir you are a professor from iit why are you asking for such low grade equipment like uh, lathes and welding machine you ask for a project with the soaps we will give you because we know you you are not going to stay there you will go with something will i said i have a house there i have a commitment to live with them you come and see my house there people said no i told the then secretary you know, i said something is wrong with your uh, approach to the tribal they have a tribal training fund mm-hmm. skill development fund i was asked to submit a project after that the expert committee asked these questions i said i don't want your money I want only if you give us. I am not something in another project. That was my personal experience. So we don't get anyway. All this effort is done by private men. There is no government on their money. Our government is Tamil Nadu money. No effort in the tribes. So there are a lot of projects. Is there any appreciation from uh, either the government or uh, government? No, the government there is no appreciation. But a lot of other agencies which recognize us, they are giving some awards here and there. because we also do organic farming okay with, with certification so that's a even in hills where there is no rain water we are help uh, them to grow millets and give them post harvesting machines that is what they got they stopped working because they could not uh, do like uh, millet they cannot uh, de- uh, husk them they are very hard so we give them small small machines to de husk them and we market them for them so that way you see the in the last 20 years the tremendous development has taken place in that village among women we taught them uh, embroidery hmm. you do at home and then uh, you earn 100 rupees more from embroidery oh. hmm women at home empowering women is really the empowering women yeah then we have these people we give them free uh, because we collect many 100 rupees from each individual give them one year of free medical help both okay uh, inpatient outpatient all medicines free under just to make them to come to hospital we have nearly 40 better hospital with extremely good facilities mm-hmm. with all the facilities ecg uh, this thing monitoring everything it is much better than a district hospital in the middle of the village and we run a school now for the staff children they said okay. our children must speak english like you they were kids uh, when we started the hospital when we trained on the girls you know all our nurses are only local girls tribal girls our doctor they trained them and uh, now the children are grown up and uh, they said they are going to build a school for them teach them english we are doing that that is a happiness great uh, <laughs> it's been a very long journey in um, small one or uh, the i don't know how many minutes you have taken about uh, 100 minutes yes a little longer yes. than that yes yes um i'm sure that this message will go to many many people once it comes out as a uh, project of uh, the heritage center of iit mudras 
I hope some of the remarks that you have made reaches the people to whom it is meant. And uh, with that note, let me take. Uh, thank you very much. I think. Uh, Thanks for your time and uh, I think I thank the Heritage Center, Mr. Kumaran and uh, Mrs. Uh, Mamata for the effort they are taking to talk to the alumni senior, and faculty senior, together, senior people, senior yes. people who have spent a lot of time to get a feedback of their experience yeah. now and then uh, make it public. I think uh, people uh, I think yeah, I'm opinion, sure yes. I'm going to I think uh, yeah. I have said a lot of things, they are purely my opinion. Yeah, not okay. meant to hurt to people, but my personal feeling because we have worked so much 50 years in this business of education and uh, technology. So certain times when I used to really get frustrated because of somebody not supporting, not understanding. So uh, whatever I said is because of that frustration, but it is not meant to hurt to anybody. But really, yeah, I think I what uh, whatever you have said will be taken in the, in the true spirit of it. But uh, I am really thankful to really my career growth, the opportunities, especially the final great opportunity of NAOT came because of my association with IIT Madras, yeah. Washing Center, because I never expected that I would become an ocean engineer <laughs> and, uh, and especially my association with Professor Shear and Turbomish Laboratory, the support given them and the training and so mm. and that has helped me in other parts of life, you know, you became a better overall well-rounded person and then we are able to help people. So the hands-on experience everywhere helpful, either in our rural technology or hospital okay. or ocean technology, we are able to see through a wide spectrum of activities because of that great experience from IIT Madras. I thank okay, I think one thing I forgot is uh, asking something about the family. <laughs> yeah.